This is the inner sanctum of freedom fighter, ruthless despot, and music lover, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, the Russian revolutionary. Lenin adored music, and this is his beloved piano. His favorite piece was Beethoven's Appassionata. I would listen to it every day, he said. What wonderful things human beings can do. But Lenin also feared music, recognizing its unique power to manipulate us. Music affects your nerves, he said, makes you say stupid things and stroke people's heads. And now you mustn't. You must hit them without mercy. And Lenin was far from the only political leader in the 20th century who understood and tried to exploit the power of music. What fascinates me is music's uncanny ability to stir us up, to calm us down, to express every possible human emotion. It bypasses language and reason and aims instead directly for our souls. And that's what makes music so incredibly powerful and also potentially incredibly dangerous. In this series, I'll be exploring how, in a radical war of ideas, music became a weapon to manipulate millions. You don't decide what the music of the Soviet Union is. We decide. I'll discover how smash hits aimed to inspire revolution. How the dictators used music as an instrument of oppression. And how composers fought back. You can hear Shostakovich slapping Stalin in the face. Bam, bam, bam. I'll show how the soundtrack to war forged national identities. Immediately, you've got rolling English countryside and planes in the sky, and I mean, he just knew how to write these big patriotic tunes. And how music was sometimes even a matter of life and death. We were very well aware that as long as they want us, be stupid to put us in the gas chamber. In these decades of revolution, repression, and total war, music was exploited by those in power like never before. Music can console us and it can corrupt us, inspire resistance or collusion. So as I explore the soundtrack to these tempestuous times, I'll also try to make sense of what to think and what to feel about the music and musicians tainted by history. I'm off to enjoy some rabble-rousing cabaret, 1920s style. After the First World War and before the Nazis, Germany enjoyed a brief fling with radical democracy. Was die Männer können, das können wir schon lange und vielleicht die ganze Ecke mehr. Raus mit den Männern aus dem Reichstag und raus mit den Männern aus dem Landtag und raus mit den Männern aus dem Herrenhaus. Wir machen draus ein Frauenhaus. Following decades of authoritarian monarchy, a revolution left everything volatile and up for grabs. Männern aus dem Bau und renn in die Dinger mit der Frau. Wow, chuck out all the men and let the girls run the show. That is one powerful message. Cabaret embodied the dizzying energy, the progressive spirit of Germany as it emerged from the shadows of World War I. Having said Auf Wiedersehen to the Kaiser, the new democratic republic meant that censorship was out and freedom of expression was the order of the day. In other words, anything goes. <laughs> 
the brand new constitution of the Weimar Republic gave Germans not only a democratic parliament with even votes for women, but a Bill of Rights guaranteeing free speech for everyone. The unprecedented permissive air of cosmopolitan Berlin meant that people were pushing at the boundaries of what was possible in art, movies, and especially in the heady mix of songs, smoke, sex, and satire of the cabaret clubs. It was quite an explosion of expression. Yeah. It wasn't just like polite. I mean, it went no. from censorship to like drugs, nudity, sex, yeah. everything. Everything, I just, everything, I mean, everything, everything. It, it was, was everything. crazy. Yeah. It must have been an incredible feeling to really, yeah, break through and throw everything away. People wanted to feel live. They can drink, they can dance. It was a really rich period in all the arts, theatre, cabaret, dance. And that must have been so exciting, yeah. such fun. Yeah, yeah. I, I always imagine it as a really a big breathe. But it wasn't just about decadent fun. You could have found that in the clubs of London or Paris. What made Berlin's cabaret special was its sharply pointed political critique at a time when there was plenty to criticize. Reeling from humiliating defeat in the Great War, the loss of more than two million men had left Germany emasculated, divided and angry. Poverty, debt, hyperinflation, cabaret was not an escape from these bitter and explosive social problems. It tackled them head on. One of the most successful composers was Friedrich Hollander. He'd spent the war helping to entertain the German troops, but he now called for a new kind of song to grab the public's social conscience. No longer should the audience be simply amused. It should think, and if it does not want that, it should be bowled over by the rhythm. So his songs carried hard-hitting messages, like this anti-war ballad, The Red Melody. It lambasted Germany's right wing, who wanted a new war, not democracy. Mit hunderttausend Grauen und wozu Todesangst und Schreck? Ha ho! Für einen Dreck! The cabarets didn't just criticize, they also offered radical ideas for a better future and they were daringly progressive in addressing identity and sexual politics. Being gay was illegal in the Weimar Republic, but the cabarets celebrated homosexuality loud and proud. They gave voice to the growing campaign for gay rights, challenging homophobia directly in the Lavender Song. What makes them think? They have the right to say what God considers vice. What makes them think they have the right to keep us out of paradise? They make our lives hell here on earth, poisoning us with guilt and shame. If we resist, prison awaits. So a love does not speak its name. The color lavender has always been associated with the gay community. The words, the lyrics of the song is very powerful. It expresses their frustration and their determination to get equal rights, to be heard. They were defiant and they were just tired of, be of being in the shadows and hiding and being prosecuted and being punished for who they are. And, this song became the first gay anthem of its time. How much did cabaret feed into the freedom, the desires of what the gay population was after? 
these cabarets became these safe havens, these playgrounds, where these performers and artists and anyone who didn't fit into society, they could all go there and be themselves and experiment and reinvent themselves and just enjoy the evening without feeling um, judged or um, intimidated. I'm all for that. We're not afraid to be queer and different If that means hell, well, hell, then take the chance They're all so stray, uptight, upright and rigid They march in lockstep, we prefer to dance We see the world in romance and of pleasure All they can see is sheer banality Lavender nights, our greatest treasure Where we can be just who we want to be One of the biggest stars of the cabaret scene, Clara Waldorf, seemed to live out all the ideals of the Lavender Song. She was a lesbian who flaunted her sexuality and liked to cross-dress. Her risque act had been censored before the war, but in the more tolerant 1920s, she was fated everywhere. To the gender-bending cabaret crowd, Waldorf's song Hannelore struck a chord. Clara Waldorf was totally different from the other singers. They were really girls, <laughs> and they were like, hmm? and they had a nice voice, a high voice, and she was really like, whoo, like that. She was a tough guy. <laughs> Clara was the first girl in a man's suit on stage. She smoked before it was okay for women to smoke. Yeah, so she really lived this life of, you know, drink and drugs and living very openly with a, yeah. with a woman and that yeah. kind of thing. I think really a trendsetter. She was the one, that one which go through the jungle with a big knife to cut all these things. And then afterwards, Malena goes through this tunnel. Malena Dietrich. Malena Dietrich, yeah. I mean, people tell that Clara and Marlene had an affair, but nobody knows exactly. It's hard to imagine now how subversive and incendiary all this was back in the 1920s. What was liberating for some people was horrifying for the more conservative. Music was front and center of a fierce debate about the future of German society. There's no denying that Cabaret held up a mirror to the profound radicalism of Weimar Germany. And many of the hot political issues of our own day, things like political extremism, social inclusion, identity politics, were all being tested out in the laboratory that was Berlin's Cabaret scene. It's those little acts of cultural subversion that together can start to cause huge shifts in attitudes across society. Some people might reckon that you can't change the world merely by going clubbing. I disagree. I think to be in Berlin's cabaret at that moment was so political. It must have felt, in that often used phrase, like dancing on the edge of a volcano. In Russia, things were even more explosive. Here, the song on everyone's lips hailed a revolution that wasn't lavender, but red. The Russian Revolution of 1917 saw crowds of people take to the streets, forcing the Tsar to give up his throne. Radical songs like this the Internationale, which was originally a French rebel song, were roared out as the rioters declared victory for a new world order.
as the Bolsheviks cemented their power, the Internationale was adopted as the new state's anthem. Lenin, that great music lover, actively encouraged singing, believing its collective emotional appeal made it the perfect vehicle for uniting the masses behind the Soviet cause. As soon as you sing, when you're busy with this really physical experience and, and, and producing simple melodies with other people, and when you're enjoying or when you're experiencing this, this wonderful thing, you start to believe in the text as well. You can have a large group of people say something they might not believe in if they would not have been singing. The Internationale has pride of place in this commemorative LP box set of Lenin's favorite songs, issued by the state-owned record company of the Soviet Union. It's a stonking selection. There are some cracking titles in this, like uh, March Bravely, Comrades, there's You Fell in Battle, uh, Rage Tyrants, and my personal favourite, Glory to the 17th Regiment. Uh, Evenings at Home with Lenin apparently often included a jolly good sing-along. A friend of his later recalled, Vladimir Ilyich had a rather pleasant, husky voice, and he greatly loved to sing in chorus. We would usually begin the evening singing the international and tormented by the hardships of prison with great feeling. Boy, did those Bolsheviks know how to have a good time. After the revolution came several bitter years of civil war and famine in which some five million people died. For the ordinary Russians who lived through it, Music lifted morale and nourished the soul. One composer recalled that there was no bread and art took its place. At no time and in no place have I seen people not listening to but devouring music with such trembling eagerness as in Russia during those years. From the very beginning, the Bolsheviks were determined that culture should play a fundamental role in creating a bold, radical new society. Lenin declared, art belongs to the people. It should have its deepest roots in the broad masses of the workers. We must raise the level of education so that art may come to the people and the people to art. Until now, the arts have been the preserve of the metropolitan elite. But in the early 1920s, the Bolsheviks set about trying to build a distinctly Soviet culture available to all. And music was an essential part of their drive to educate and elevate the masses. In 1922, a new orchestra was created called Persimfans. It staged performances in factories and villages where workers and peasants crowded in for their very first taste of classical music. Many representatives of the class really wanted and wanted to culture that was not available for them until the revolution. Персимфанс невероятно современным для того момента. Они интересовались, они пытались наладить обратную связь с публикой. More than that, the musicians themselves tried to live out the egalitarian ideals of the revolution by sitting in a circle and ditching the conductor. В первую очередь, конечно, идея коллективности и участия каждого в общем деле в равной степени. Основная, конечно, идея заключается в том, что роль дирижера как бы переходит 
от одного человека ко всем участникам процесса. When you think of an orchestra, it is almost the ultimate hierarchy, isn't it? That you have this kind of leader figure, the ultimate leader who cannot be questioned, that's the conductor, and then you get the first violins and everybody else is sort of underneath them. You can see that there's some kind of correlation there between not having a conductor and not having a czar. Orchestra is a small country. When musicians start working not from the chair of the director, but from their own initiative, the result is completely different. Musically speaking, um, I think it, it would be ideal if you wouldn't need a conductor. I mean, being a conductor, that's a very weird thing to say, maybe. But there is no such thing as a real democracy in music, because if you imagine you want to rehearse a large symphony with an orchestra and you want everybody in the orchestra to have a say about something, you would need like three months to, to prepare a program. Whereas if you have a conductor, you can be ready in three hours. The whole idea of working without a conductor is fantastic, but it doesn't work in, in practical sense. So, good idea in theory, hard to achieve in practice. A little like communism itself. But amid the turmoil of the 1920s, ideals thrived. For a brief period, Russia was fizzing with a sense of exciting possibility and opportunity. The wholesale social and economic upheaval brought about by the revolution promised to fast forward the nation into modernity. People truly believed that by breaking free from the chains of the past, they'd experience a new utopian dawn. For cutting-edge composers, that meant it was time to ring the changes on a new world order. Musicians across Europe and America were tearing up the rule book in search of fresh new sounds. There was jazz in New York, the wild harmonic experiments of Schoenberg in Vienna, Stravinsky's futuristic ballets in Paris. But for me, the most cool, kicking, creative place on earth back then was right here in Moscow. This was the brave new world where anything was possible, where music could be as iconoclastic as the new state itself. One composer who was fanatical in his determination to smash up the old and bring in the new was Arseniy Avramov, a pioneer in sound technology. In 1920, Avramov submitted a proposal to the Soviet People's Commissar for Education, suggesting, quite reasonably, that every single piano in Russia should be demolished. Avramov's proposal grew out of the egalitarian principles of class struggle. In Russia, the piano was seen as the king of all instruments. In fact, the word in Russian for grand piano is royal. So, Avramov thought, just as the Romanov royal family had been violently murdered in the revolution, the sounds of old imperial Russia had to be destroyed too. Now, what I'm about to do gives me no pleasure at all, but I have been promised that this instrument is at death's door and needs to be put out of its misery. This is all in the spirit of the revolution, you understand. Safety goggles on. Sledgehammer, please. Thank you. Drag pianos out into the streets, wrote revolutionary poet Mayakovsky in his poem An Order to the Art Army. Drums with boat hooks from windows hang, hammer pianos bang on the bellowing drum. Let there be crashes, let there be thunder. for the people's collective of piano tuners, Russia's pianos were not destroyed. But that didn't stop avant-garde musicians looking for radical new ways to create a revolution in sound.
Avramov described this bizarre box as a big step into the future, a social revolution in the art of music. It's one of the very first electronic instruments, a theremin. seeming to magic music out of thin air, a theremin player never touches the instrument. Instead, hand movements through the invisible electromagnetic fields of its two antennae create the theremin's eerie, otherworldly sound. It's named after its inventor, Lev Theremin, an engineer and amateur cellist who accidentally stumbled across this extraordinary sound during a science experiment into new uses of electricity. Keeping the family tradition alive today is his great-grandson, Peter Theremin. Peter, that performance was so beautiful and ethereal and strange. Your great-grandfather took his instrument to Lenin himself. What was that experience like for him? What happened? In 1921, was the first public demonstration in Moscow, and the news was released by Lenin. And, of course, Lenin could not stop and invited Lev to the cabinet in the Kremlin, where Lev and далее Ленин решил самостоятельно попробовать поиграть на Терменбоксе. По указанию Ленина Термену был выдан такой мандат на проезд по железным дорогам Советской России, и уже более 200 городов в 20-е годы познакомились с Терменбоксом благодаря Ленину. Можно сказать, что это единственный случай в истории, когда пропаганда электромузыкального инструмента поддерживалась государством. It also really chimed with that idea of bringing modernity to Soviet Russia, and also this sense that this was an instrument that was available to everybody, that, that in effect everybody could theoretically play a theremin. Да, безусловно, терминвокс очень демократичный музыкальный инструмент, потому что человек не должен преодолевать сопротивление струны, клавиши, то все равно он может играть на терминвоксе музыку. Well, if it was good enough for Lenin. <laughs> oh, it's much harder than it looks. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Theremin, uh, you've defeated me. I can't do it. For musical revolutionaries, it wasn't just innovative instruments that would create the soundtrack to a Soviet utopia. 
a new kind of music was required that would capture the industrial roar of the proletariat. And it was wannabe piano destroyer Arseniy Avramov who took that idea to its greatest heights. In November 1923, he stepped out onto the rooftop of this power station, clutching two flags. These were to be his batons for conducting an absolutely loopy and brilliant piece written to mark the anniversary of the revolution, his Symphony of Sirens. Think of a symphonic premiere, and you might imagine a polite affair within the confines of a concert hall. Not this premiere. Avramov's Symphony of Sirens was an epic open-air spectacle where the orchestra was the noise of the city itself. And yes, you're listening to Avramov's Symphony right now. He conducted a musical arrangement of factory sirens and bells, ship fog horns and seaplanes, a choir of trucks and cars, fireworks, artillery, several full infantry regiments, steam locomotives, as well as a military band, a few massive choirs, and a specially made steam whistle machine that could toot the Internationale. The whole thing lasted several hours. This was a new kind of music, said Avramov, designed to evoke the happy chaos of a machine-driven world, where all of society worked together to achieve its revolutionary ideals. It's hard to know whether the crowds of the time enjoyed Avramov's unusual symphony, but what do modern Muscovites make of it? It is music. <laughs> Dangerous. <laughs> it's quite depressing. Not very pleasant. Это не Моцарт, конечно, и не там даже не популярная советская музыка. Это вообще непонятно что. The fact is, for all its revolutionary principles, avant-garde music was never massively popular. For ordinary Russians, as the 1920s progressed, life gradually got more comfortable. The economy picked up and cultural links with the West reopened. American dance music became all the rage, to the horror of some Bolsheviks. So far, the only place where they don't dance the foxtrot is on streetcars and in cemeteries, declared the St. Petersburg Red Gazette in 1928. It wasn't exactly what Lenin had in mind when he declared that art belongs to the people. Disapproving party members judged such light music to be ideologically suspect and wanted to take control. One self-appointed group of busybodies took it upon themselves to decide what the revolution should and should not sound like. The Russian Association of Proletarian Musicians, or RAPM as it's known, helpfully created two categories so things were incredibly clear. There was proletarian music, good, bourgeois music, bad. So popular dance tunes, well, they were out, too Western. Jazz, too decadent. What about avant-garde orchestral music? Too elitist. Even the classics weren't safe. The militant group even targeted Sergei Rachmaninoff, a hugely popular composer and one of music's all-time greats.
but Rachmaninoff was no Bolshevik and had left Russia immediately after the revolution. The proletarian musicians passed a resolution. Rachmaninoff's works are reactionary, reflecting a decadent mood of the bourgeoisie that is particularly harmful in the bitter conditions of class struggle on the musical front. They concluded that Rachmaninoff's music should be banned. such soaring, beautiful music. To me, the idea that it's harmful is downright absurd. But that kind of thinking reflected a growing new taste for censorship. From the late 1920s, the grip of control was tightening right across Soviet society. Under Lenin's successor, Stalin, music would become increasingly caught up in ideological tussles. Now behind every piece of music was an argument. Did it sufficiently reflect the voice of the people and the party? For all the debate, no one doubted that music mattered. Whether it was through singing songs to rally people round the Soviet cause, or as a form of education and enlightenment bringing culture to the masses, it could give voice to the radical spirit and shed light on the class struggle. Whatever your political stripes, people truly believed that music wasn't just a mirror to society, it was a tool to really change things. In the democratic Weimar Republic of late 1920s Germany, that was just as true. Here, music and politics had become increasingly radical, not just in the cabarets, but in the songs of the streets and even at the opera. To look at Kurt Weil, a shy young composer with perfectly ironed trousers, you wouldn't think he had a revolutionary bone in his body. Yet, he was ambitious to shake up the world. Weil was fiercely left-wing and wanted to use music to mobilize Germany's working class in opposition to capitalism. Kurt Weil was convinced that musicians should be forging the future. If music cannot service society as a whole, he said, it forfeits its right to exist in today's world. He was also determined to bridge the age-old gap between elitist, highfalutin classical music and popular song. What Weil wanted was art for the people, to have his music heard on the grandest stages and also whistled by people out on the street. It was a tall order. In August 1928, here at the Schiffbar Dam Theatre, the curtain rose on Weil's shocking new show, the Thrupney Opera. It was a collaboration with a provocative young poet and playwright, Bertolt Brecht. The Thrupney Opera is a damning critique of Weimar Germany. Its plot satirizes its capitalist society as morally corrupt, violent and exploitative. The central character is master criminal and pimp Mac Heath, whose menacing charm is memorably introduced by the show's greatest hit, Die Moritat von Mackie Messer. In other words, 
Mac the Knife. Und der Haifisch, der hat Zähne und die trägt ihr im Gesicht. Und Mekith, der hat Das Messer sieht man nie. We think of Mac the Knife as big band swing, smooth lounge music. But as German music theatre star Stefan Kirk makes clear, it's incredibly dark. Liegt ein toter Mann am Strand und ein Mensch Den Mann Mac die Messer nennt und Schmulmeier bleibt verschwunden. Mac Heath is a serial killer and rapist, the brutal embodiment of corrupt power in a violent, sick society. A smiling psychopath. Mackie Messer. Dem man nichts beweisen kann. Jenny Tauler ward gefunden mit einem Messer in der Brust und am Kai geht Mackie Messer, der von allen. It's about murderers and it's about prostitutes and it's about the kind of seedy underbelly of the city. How much do you think audiences who came to those first productions in the 20s would have felt it was about their own world? For them, uh, it was the first time you could see characters on stage which they knew from, from their daily life because Berlin was full of prostitutes back then. <laughs> There were lots of criminals and also lots of uh, poor people, so they could really uh, identify with the characters on stage, which they couldn't when they went to a series opera. The way Stefan sings the song mm -hmm. is very different from the way that we're used to hearing it in that jazzy Hollywood Broadway version. It's a particularly dark, menacing way of doing that. How much is that sort of authentic to the spirit of the way that Brecht would have done this song? The melody is very sweet, so you can sing it very sweet, uh, but Brecht didn't. He wanted to have it in a very dark way, like a little bit threatening. So it's, it's, a, it's a murder who's singing it, you know. <laughs> Wachte auf und ward geschändet, Mäcki welche. Ironically, the Thrutney Opera, which was meant to be an attack on the evils of capitalism, was a huge commercial hit. Thrupney fever spread through Europe, leading to hundreds of new productions and in 1931, a musical film. No doubt about it, Viles' music, like almost no other, had succeeded in finding that sweet spot between popular culture and high art. 
But what of Brecht and Weil's other aim, that their work should help improve society? Looking back on it years later, Bertolt Brecht liked to claim that this show had genuinely changed attitudes. I'm not so sure about that. Certainly today, the political message has receded, and what you're left with is the infectious brilliance and energy of Kurt Weill's score. Great entertainment with great tunes. Now, I reckon Weill was torn about that. He wanted to change the world, but like any composer, he also really wanted a smash hit. And that is an inherent tension for any political musician. You write something that juicy, and everybody wants a bite. When the clock strikes half past six, babe, time to head for golden light. Hey, it's a good time for a great taste dinner at McDonald's. It's Mac tonight. Come on, make it Mac tonight. Brecht and Vile must be turning in their graves. The audiences who flocked to see the Thrupney Opera recognised its world of violence as a reflection of their own. The feverish fun of the cabaret era was fading. The Wall Street crash of 1929 brought new economic depression and undermined faith in parliamentary politics. The backlash was rising extremism. Roving gangs increasingly occupied the streets, some communists and some belonging to a new far-right party, the National Socialists, the Nazis. They appealed to those who found the changes unleashed by the Weimar democratic experiment alarming rather than liberating. Music, whether it was Kurt Weill or Cabaret, became the focus of everything that was meant to be wrong with Germany. It was liberal, it was lefty, and often it was Jewish. The next joint show from Brecht, a communist sympathiser, and Weil, who was Jewish, was disrupted by Nazis throwing stink bombs at the stage. The fight between left and right played out in the cabarets. In the early 1930s, Friedrich Hollander, still composing angry political songs, opened the Tingle Tangle a new club where he publicly lampooned the Nazis and their fanatical anti-Semitism. So, Siegfried, this is a song that I know you know really well from your cabarets, written in 1931 by Friedrich Hollander, who's uh, a Jewish composer. The words are by him, and he takes this really famous tune from Bizet's Carmen and writes this really dark song. Let's have a go at doing it. I feel slightly weird about singing uh, this song. First time in English for me. Okay. okay. Well, first time in English, or in fact, any language for me. Okay. Uh, let's have a go. If it's raining or if it's healing, if there's lightning, if it's wet, if it's dark or if there's thunder, if you freeze or if, if you sweat, if it's warm or if it's cloudy, if it thaws and there's a breeze, if it drizzles, if it sizzles, if you cough or if you sneeze, it's all the fault of all the Jews, all the Jews are all at fault oh why and how are they at fault do you not understand it's all their fault and me too it's all your fault the jews are they and they are all at fault and don't doubt it it's all their fault the jews the jews they are all see oh it's a horrible weird it's a weird song i don't i mean it's very close to the bone that yeah it is um we feel it like this now and i think 
a lot of the audience in the former times were like, <laughs> yeah, of course, I know it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And for us now, it's with all this knowledge. Yeah, um, with everything about that what happened, happened afterwards. It's like, it you is. have to really to say, oh, breeze, 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 um, and try to understand the situation in which it's written. I mean, that's the thing, the song gets progressively more absurd. It's, you know, the, yep. the sausages taste of soap, the yep. Prince of Wales is gay, your dog can't do a poo, yep. it's all the fault, it's all of, the the fault Jews. of the Jews, everything, the everything, the Jews. everything, everything. It is an interesting point that so many cabaret singers and artists were hugely political, but they really underestimated what was coming. Do you think those kinds mm. of people could have done more, could have been more politically engaged, and that it was sort of all the world's a joke, haha, mm. and then it was too late to do anything. I think we, um, we can't blame Hollander for writing this because nobody had ever before experienced a thing like that. What comes after this song, nobody. Now we knew, no. And now we have to be very careful, everybody, because we know what can happen after a funny song. I think we should sing it, even if it hurts. We should sing it to remember and uh, to be aware. rather charming little tune is what the Germans might call an Ohrwurm, literally an earworm. Once it gets inside your head, you cannot get rid of it whether you want to or not. However, you would not want to find yourself playing or even singing this in Germany today, because these notes are considered so powerful, so controversial, that under Article 86A of the German Penal Code, to even hum this tune in public means that you could be arrested or you could be sentenced to up to three years in prison. It's known as the Horst Vessel song after the young Nazi stormtrooper who wrote it. Horst Wessel had dropped out of law school to devote himself to the Nazi cause. In the late 1920s, he and his gang of uniformed thugs would march, singing provocatively through Berlin's streets, spoiling for a fight with their great enemies, the communists. Music was a key weapon. Kampfleader, fight or struggle songs were roared out on both sides while the punches were being thrown. A bit like chanting on the football terraces today, this was music as intimidation, as a sign of tribal allegiance. And Horst Wessel had a real nose for this kind of thing. He knew how to write a tune that would summon up the blood during a good old scrap. He called his song Die Fahne Hoch, The Flag Is High. Horst Wessel's song was a mishmash of various other tunes. He even deliberately plundered a communist favourite just to wind them up. His song was easy to sing, easy to march to. It packed a real punch. But it might well have been lost to history had it not been for a dramatic turn of events. In 1930, when he was just 22 years old, Horst Wessel was murdered by a gang of communist rivals. A young martyr for the Third Reich, wrote Nazi propaganda chief Goebbels in his diary with cynical glee. Wessel's funeral was turned into a major event as the Nazis capitalised on his death. 
Vessel was now painted as a hero who'd sacrificed himself in the noble struggle to restore Germany to her former greatness. From then on, his song became a key piece of propaganda. When the Nazis were elected to power in 1933, the Horst Vessel song was ubiquitous, played at every rally and official occasion. Fully exploiting music's power to stir people up into unthinking enthusiasm, the tune was just as much a symbol of Nazism as the swastika. So I've played the horse vessel song. Can I sing it? I have actually thought long and hard about this one and it really sticks in my craw to sing the words of this song. It's because it's such a dark incitement to violence that somehow jars with that very pretty little tune. It's still banned in Germany today, although that doesn't stop countless neo-Nazi groups around the world singing the Horst Vessel song very proudly. Now, I don't agree with banning it. I don't think censorship is remotely helpful with music or with any other art form, actually. Let it be there in the world. We need to look this stuff in the eye. But Horst Vessel stands as a kind of warning of the power, the incendiary heat of music to inflame and ignite us in ways that invoke freedom and the best of the human spirit, but also the very worst, most depraved things that human beings can do, and that we ignore that power at our peril. the freedoms of the Weimar Republic were over. All the arts would come under attack in the Third Reich. Just weeks after the Nazi takeover, Kurt Weil found his music was forbidden. Kurt Weill was tipped off that he was on a Nazi blacklist and was about to be arrested by the Gestapo. He packed a bag and he fled, never to return to Germany again. Friedrich Hollander left too, along with countless other cabaret artists, many of them Jewish. From now on, the Nazis would have culture under their total control. Next time, with Hitler and Stalin in power, the dictators try to harness and manipulate music like never before. So how will musicians respond as every piece becomes a battleground?